If you've never done a prime rib before, that price tag can be a little intimidating, but I want to show you my foolproof method to get it spot on for everybody, whether they like it medium rare or well done. Uh, I'm going to show you a fun way to get it spot on for everybody, get that beautiful bark and a wonderful sear. Let's get them. We're going to learn how to cook with confidence today. All right, no more wandering into this recipe worried. Are we going to be able to do it? Are we going to mess it up? No. Okay, very simple. If you're armed with proper techniques coming into this cook, you're going to hit a home run every single time. Our good friends at E3 Beef sent us this beautiful one, two, three bone on ribeye. Don't be fooled, don't be intimidated by these bones. Uh, this method is gonna stand true whether you've got bone on or bone off. I appreciate the bones on there because I feel like it radiates a little bit more heat and it, uh, it brings more flavor and fun to the whole dish. But if you're boneless, no worries, same deal. Let's get it out of the package and let's scruff. Let me show you. Scruffing is nothing more than creating more surface area. And you can imagine, okay, this is what we've got, but if we put these little slices across the surface of the meat, now we've got all these beautiful nooks and crannies, pathways for smoke, seasoning, and rendering fat to all distribute. Okay, we're gonna do the same thing on the other side. Uh, if all you have at home is salt and pepper, so be it. I like to use a Lane's Barbecue brisket seasoning. It's heavy on the salt and pepper, but it's got some other fun ingredients like thyme and paprika and granulated garlic in there, but salt and pepper is A-OK. -okay. I'm gonna use my salty seasoning first and just shaking, even getting that fat cap over there, shaking it all around, whip it over, get some on the side. After you have your salt and pepper, uh, we could just leave it at that, but I'm gonna add a little bit of uh, uh, sugar to the outside. Not just sugar, but a sweeter rub. So I'm gonna go Kunami, uh, and that's gonna help build that bark. You think about what sugar does when it gets hot, it caramelizes. So first thing was the salt and pepper on the outside, and that's gonna start wicking out because salt on meat and osmosis. Uh, and then we're gonna put this sweet rub on the outside of that to kind of lock everything in with a beautiful caramelized crust. Fundamentals, and I like to say fun, F-U-N, fundamentals here, uh, that we're all seasoned up. So again, we've lit our fire. We're not worried about stabilizing it yet. It's say okay all right? We just got some charcoal in there, 25% full. We're lit up, we've scruffed, we've seasoned. Now let's talk about smoke and grill setup. Bit of hickory today. We're gonna go one chunk. Notice I've got a good roaring bed of coals here. I'm gonna bury this wood chunk in the hottest portion of the coals. Once I see combustion, I know I'm getting that clean blue smoke. If you're not sure about blue smoke, don't worry about it. Just know that's the good smoke, the transparent, the wispy, not that big billowy, like a tires on fire uh, smoke we want clear translucent smoke for that sweet sweet flavor and it's combusted right now I can smell it but I can't see it that tells me I'm there grill setup All right, let's put this deflector shield in create an indirect zone and we'll put a grill grate right on top of that and so this is the side we'll do the smoking and on this side we'll do our direct searing to build that bark now together we've just created two zone cooking on our one grill surface. You've got your indirect side where we're gonna do low and slow and build up that kind of caramelization when you think of the smell of roasting coffee or, or the outside of baking bread, that kind of Maillard reaction. And on the other side, we've got direct sear, access to the flame where we're building those big, bold flavors and that quick caramelization. This is a celebration of both folks, but if you feel like you're getting aggressive on one side, move it on over. So essentially two zone cooking gives us complete control and options. We're gonna put presentation side down first and that's that beautiful side we scored first and we're gonna go right on that direct side, building that sear, building that bark. I'm gonna close the dome. This is a hot smoke sear. So we've got our combustion on our smoking wood and it's getting locked into the bark. We're gonna sit here for about five minutes, flip it for another five minutes, and then move it over, graduate it to the indirect side. 
beautiful. As soon as I open that, I get the aroma of the dripping fat on the charcoal. That's what we want. Let's go ahead and flip this thing over together. That's what I'm talking about. Bubbly deliciousness. All that rendering. Now we're gonna put it bone side down. And start searing that other side. We could have started it bone side down first and then hit the other side, but I like that big fat cap to sear first, then flip over. So all those avenues that we sliced, again, the rendering just goes down it like nooks and crannies. Think about these little sports cars of deliciousness driving through there, honking their horn, collisions are happening, delicious things are going on. Four or five more minutes here, then we're gonna move it over. We're not trying to burn it. We're just starting the rendering process and caramelization. Lid down so we can accept some of that smoke into the bark. 450 degrees. Beautiful aromas. Let's just flip it over and see what it looks like. Oh yeah, that bark set in nice. Notice how not only did the seasoning tack up, but it's starting to lock in. Oh, I absolutely love what I'm seeing. So we're gonna put this on the indirect side now. And I've got it. The direct side rolling here, so smoke is gonna to continue to billow over. And we're just gonna cook it till we get to that internal temperature of 120 degrees. I'm gonna close this dome, and in order to get to that 120 internal, uh, I'm gonna drop this temperature by closing the airflow. I'm gonna drop this to about 300 degree Fahrenheit. So we got a 300 degree grill now and we're gonna check back in about 15 minutes and probably give that roast a twist. Lovely. Look at that. I wanna show you these bones. They're starting to reveal a little bit. Marrow is starting to render out. So remember, technique. This roast was sitting with this side towards the direct side. So this is gonna be cooking faster than this side. So we've come to an internal temperature of 90 degrees now. So I'm gonna flip and let this side start to come up. Remember, we're gunning for that 120 degree mark. So no matter how big your roast is, I'm not telling you how long it's gonna take, okay? You can look that stuff up on the internet, where they say for every four to five pounds, whatever. I never remember that, I don't care, okay? So however big your roast is, you want to come to a temperature of 90 degrees and then rotate it, all right? So if, you're, if you have a larger roast and it's sitting east to west versus north to south, just remember, when you get to 90 degrees, flip it, okay? And we're gonna come up slowly at a grill temp of 300 until we get to 120 now. So lid's going down and we're gonna continue to roast. What's happening now is all the collagen and gelatin on the inside are starting to break down. All that intermuscular fat or marbling that we paid for in that prime rib is starting to turn into flavor and it's starting to turn into moisture content. So this is what, this is what we were after. We're at 90 now, now we're slowly cruising to that 120. Good job, team. Beautiful, look at that smoke on the outside. Beautiful bark. Let's take that internal temperature. 118, 119. I like it. All right, close enough. We're gonna take this beautiful roast off. Slide it right onto our cutting board. And we're gonna let this beautiful piece of meat rest for 15 minutes, okay? Now I'm gonna take my ash tool and I'm gonna bank my charcoal underneath the direct side. So we're gonna let this roast rest. Instead of adding more charcoal, we'll go ahead and take these grill grates and lower them down closer to the fuel source and that's gonna give us a bigger, bolder sear when we're ready. We're not gonna slice it yet. We need to let it rest for 15 minutes. Let those juices evenly distribute. While that's resting, let's whip up a very simple yet very satisfying sauce. It's a Parmesan garlic sauce. We're gonna start with a little Duke's mayonnaise. There we are. Uh, let's go in with some Parmesan cheese and some large or coarse chopped garlic. 
touch of salt, touch of black pepper, and chives. Simple, simple stuff. Uh, these flavors go really well together, and it is just a really nice accoutrement for that steak. That fresh garlic is going to be really pungent and kind of takes the place of what you would think of your traditional horseradish. We kept big pieces, so when you bite in, the intensity is there. Uh, you can use horseradish sauce if you want, but we made a horseradish cream sauce last year, so we got to switch things up. I don't want a Groundhog Day here, okay? So we got a really nice, thick Parmesan garlic sauce. That uh, chive brings a little punch of onion, and we're just going to let this sit as we slice and sear the steaks. Let's go ahead and get to slicing. This is a thing of beauty. So I'm gonna stand it up and you notice one, two, and three, we see our ribs here that's gonna help guide the knife. So I have nice even cuts. I'm not cutting wedges. We're gonna go straight down. Oh my gosh. Look at that steak, dude. Coast to coast delicious right there. So we're gonna sit that up. One more slice, and again, make sure you're not slicing at an angle. I don't want wedges here. I want nice, even steaks right down the middle. Oh yeah, look at these beauties. So I know some of you are thinking right now, stop, stop, that's it, that's right where I want it. No, it's not, no, it's not. We're gonna season, look at all this. This is just real estate that has never seen seasoning or searing. So what a great opportunity to take a little bit more of that brisket and just get a little on that surface area. Notice how it's just drinking it up right now. Yes, yes, yes. And we're gonna put it face down right on there. So again, now's your opportunity. Those who want it a little more rare, boom, serve it just as is if you like, or put a quick sear on it. Oh, look at that, look at that. Another touch, another touch. We're gonna let this go for about, I don't know, five more seconds. All right, let's bring it off. Oh yeah. Now there's no need to let these rest again. We're ready to just serve like this, or we could slice and put it on a platter. What do you want to do? Nathan, what do you think? I think both. Let's do both. All right, so let's plate this up. You know, you could take two of these and just serve them kind of cross hatch like this. And then let's slice the other one and kind of spin it around here. So the way I would attack this steak is I would cut it off the bone or release the bone by holding it up. Of course, it's screaming hot right now. And then we'll use that bone, but look at that. Oh, look at all that fat and deliciousness. You know what I'm gonna do. You know what I'm gonna do. Just a little bit more, I can't help myself. And then right on here, that's a chef's treat right there while we're slicing this. Now we're going for the deckel, okay? This is the best part of the entire steer. Spinalis or ribeye cap. That bite right there might very well be the best bite in North Carolina right now at this, this very second. That is gorgeous stuff. Now we'll go for this center eye. And as the oxygen interacts with the myoglobin, it's gonna to begin to bloom out or rouge out. We're gonna see that nice medium rare coast to coast. So folks, again, checklist. Get your grill lit, scruff, season, Get good smoke, little sear on each side, low and slow, rest, slice, sear again, plate up. Oh my gosh. You know, when you have a great steak, you want to do that sauce on the side. Mmm. This is a thing of beauty. And you know I'm going for that spinalis right now. Screaming hot. Just a touch of that sauce, just like that. Here we are. Holy cow, it just melts in your mouth. It's so beefy. The garlic Parmesan comes in right after the end and just begs you to take another bite.
um, this rib. That's going to be me all day. It's screaming hot, but I cannot wait to bite into that. And then you've got these gorgeous pieces of shingled beef. And notice how we've given it enough temperature so that all that intermuscular fat has just melted. And it just, it just pulls beautifully. Again, that's going to continue to rouge up. If you've never done a prime rib, don't be intimidated. It's all about grill temperature and internal temperature and take your time. This stuff is just absolutely stunning. I see why we use this as a celebratory roast. Uh, so prime rib all day long here at the Gephard household. This is amazing stuff. If you enjoyed this cook as much as I enjoy cooking it for you, do me a favor, give us a thumbs up, hit that notification button, and please do leave a comment from our backyard to yours. Cheers and happy grilling. Thank you.